machine, allied, of course, to human capacities, could create as much beauty uh, as the hand of the artist. And when it comes to auto-destructive art, uh, there were altogether five manifestos which uh, I produced from between the autumn of 1949 and the summer of 1964, mainly dealing with auto-destructive, auto-creative art. There again, the, the, the understanding that the machine could create the forms, the material with which auto-destructive art could be created and, and eliminating or un- making the artistic activity uh, or the handmade activity less significant or redundant. That was at the center of the idea of auto-destructive art so that all the main uh, industrial potentials of our society could be presented in the form of artworks that would uh, exist for a, a limited period of time and then be no longer required. In, so this is the autumn of 1995 with the cardboards p- presented in a small exhibition and the first manifesto. And then there was an interesting development, excuse me. We learned in London that John Tingley was preparing a, a massive auto or self-destructive work in the in the MoMA, Museum of Modern Art, and New York, and I, I decided to push forward a, a project of autodestructive art. We look at the next slide, please. In the meantime, in the autumn and winter of 1960, uh, yes, we'll, no, that's how we'll, we look at that next. Uh, in, 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 this, in March 1960, this was published in the Daily Express, the, the model for autosactive art, and composed of elements that we have on the table, which perhaps you've seen uh, on, on film. There, there is a relationship between this material, this construction of elements, and this construction here, which I will talk about later. And that has to do with a a term which I will now try and uh, fish out from my notes here. Uh, And the the term relevant to, to this and, and to this, and I think to the cardboard, is aggregate. And here's a dictionary d- definition, Oxford English, diction, English Dictionary, uh, aggregate, collection into one body, constituted by the collection of many particles or, or units, uh, or this, for example, uh, into one body, a collective total, a complex whole, mass or body, formed by the union of numerous units or particles, an assemblage. Now, this is very interesting. In the, in the course of 61, I believe, the MoMA, New York, uh, produced a major exhibition which, was, which had enormous impact on the entire art world, titled The Art of Assemblage. Now, let's, let's go to the next, to the previous slide then, the number two. Yeah, this is, so this is uh, the Committee of 100, which was formed in, in the autumn and late, early winter of 1960. And this is the first manifesto which uh, I was asked to design. First manifesto, the first statement by the committee, signed and written by uh, Bertrand Russell and uh, Reverend Ma- Michael Scott. 
so let's, let's go on then with the slides. That is the model. The idea was it could disintegrate by rust and pollution over a 10-year ten, a ten, ten period. And this model was made of this material here. Of this material. And, and found, it was found in the street. I found a box. Almost everything in those days was found in the street. And, and this element of chance was an important part of the post. It wasn't that we were trying to save money. It was just that it was so exciting to find boxes of this stuff, which I did one day. Uh, and then integrate them in, into some form of artistic expression. Now, so in March this was published, and it was published two days, <laughs> sorry, it sounds very funny, two days before Tingley's demonstration. So in a sense, I sort of have a bit of priority on that. Could we then go on to the next slide, please? Next image. The, this, the, yes. Now, this is a section of the lecture demonstration which took place. So we have got March 1960. This is June 1960, and the first lecture demonstration took place at at uh, the Temple Gallery in, in in the beginning of Knightsbridge. And this is a section where you have found object, yeah, a bag filled with. And not so much rubbish, but rather paper and textile. Look, actually quite beautiful. Found in the street, hung up, presented as it was. There were, I didn't sort of tart it up or, or improve it or anything. It was just a bag. And behind newspapers. And newspapers, as many of you will know, became a dominant part of my whole life uh, as a person and as an artist. It's, it's from then onwards newspapers, and particularly the day's newspapers. This is the day's newspapers hung up at, what is at random. Here on the next slide, so this is on the left-hand corner, you can imagine there's a table, like here, not as big as this, a table, and on the left-hand side was this bag with the newspapers. On the right-hand side, on the floor, were cardboards, including the cardboards that were shown at uh, at the gallery, at, at rather at Monmouth Street. And here is the first uh, presentation of a painting with acid on sheets of nylon, and the nylon was affixed with a distance of a few centimeters, affixed, stretched behind the glass. The glass was largely meant in order to protect an audience of 25 or 30 people sitting in front, to the left of the glass. And you will see that in the middle of the table there is a structure, and what we, uh, the origin of this, my invitation, the, the reason I was invited today to take part was in fact to show a reconstruction of that central position. If you switch to the next slide, we may see it more clearly. You see now, uh, the structure of rods. Again, a found object. And just as we didn't know the origin of the cardboards, we never, and not through all the decades, found out what these rods were for. The rods there were not identical to this, they were more complex. We have here, this is made up of two rods, one bigger, as you see, than the other. But the rods there had, so, had sort of box-like shapes, some of them. They were sticking out at angles. In other words, a greater complexity than we have here. Uh, in the 60s show, uh, the Tate 60s show, uh, a young lady, an artist, spent three weeks reconstructing those, uh, that, those shapes. Three weeks. Well, we weren't prepared to do that here. And I don't think it was required. So, but bear, so bear in mind, the complexity there is greater than here. On the right, you see the model there, the model that we saw in the photograph, uh, and there were other, possibly other, one or two other objects. So here I was painting away. This is a, 
I painted for half an hour. This would be about 10 minutes in. And we go back to the previous slide. Back. So uh, there's less painting going on. This paint. Go forward, please. So this is the end of that uh, painting session. Photographed 24 hours after the event. And what had happened in between, and this is so fascinating, the, the work continued. It, if you like, grew. It opened up and it grew at the same time. Now, I go back to a few months before, no, a few weeks before, a few weeks before this demonstration, I was in King's Lynn, where I had lived for a long time, and preparing for this dem lecture demonstration, which the date was fixed, only I didn't know how to do it. And I suppose that's where we can bring in the word experiment. So I experimented with different materials. I put acid, I, want, I knew acid had to be used. What else would so disintegrate material? Acid, I tried wood, I tried textiles, I tried tissues. I thought, well, tissues, surely, thin stuff, that would, no. And finally, at some point, I managed to get some nylon and it worked instantly. And so uh, a photographer, John Cox, who had taken the photographs of the model, came up and photographed the first sort of experiment of nylon. And this is painting acid on nylon. This was the second experiment. And it is quite unlike the first. The first was on some kind of hardboard. Now here, once it happened, we saw something that was totally surprising that the, the uh, nylon and the acid formed a, a kind of glue, a paste, you'll see it uh, in between. And, and, and that created a completely unexpected and from an aesthetic point of very, uh, I think, very advanced extension of what we had at King's Lynn, which was simply a, a, a matter of, sort of cuts like you might see in a Fontana. So here, we had something which was unexpected, which came through experiment. And in fact, auto-instructive art is still an experiment in as far as we've got a theory, but the, the practice is almost non-existent. And uh, if one was to pursue auto-destructive art, uh, there, there would be all kinds of necessities for experiments. Now, during the lecture, I had a, a set of metal forms, very thin, about 50, and suddenly I lifted them up and dropped them on the floor, and I, I made the point, and the point is central, that if, and this comes back to aggregates, if the unit, if this unit has such quality, and I think it's, it's, it's as good as the, the Mies van der Rohe Seagram building, and it relates to that, I believe. If that unit is so significant and, and you keep adding and, and building with it, then you are going to possibly create great forms and possibly great works of art. And, and when the unit has this quality, it doesn't matter if I throw it on the floor. I'm not going to do it because you, you couldn't actually see the point. Uh, but as they scatter, as they interrelate, the significance of the, in, the inherent significance will transmit uh, through the, the apparent chaos. And so I dropped that and I said, that's the point I make. It doesn't matter how they interrelate, it'll be significant. And I picked this up and, and I lifted it, but I, I'll just endeavor to do it now and make the same point. But it doesn't matter how how, how they relate. They relate with significance because there is a significance in, in each element. It doesn't matter what I do. There, something happens that, that has a meaning and in, in, in more senses than simply in aesthetics or in, in artistic practice. You notice, of course, there's an element of sound in, in this.
So I'm just wondering at the time, are we, we are coming, we've got I think another few, 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 few minutes. In developing auto-destructive art, the theory of auto-creative art uh, comes as inherently uh, in the picture as, as these forms opened up, other forms are created. And, and so uh, in, in, in auto-creative art, for example, in the liquid crystal projections, you have temperature which guides the progression of the work. And the temperature uh, variations can be as minute as possible, as minute as they can be. Uh, but in, in fact, they will register as changes in color and in, in, in movement and in, in interaction. And uh, I think that that is a, a contribution which you can describe in terms of auto-creative art. I'm, I've got a feeling that we are on time now, so thank you for your attention.